Okay, Saints, uh, I always do this. We're about 10 minutes behind. <laughs> I should just say I'm giving you at least a 20-minute uh, warm-up. It's me, Brother Ron, from Northern California Grace Fellowship. Um, we've had our morning study on um, shedding light on prayer, number four. We, do, we, do, we are going to have a, a, a fifth part and, and last part. We've been getting much good feedback. I'll talk more about that here during the Facebook Live. I've been getting some good feedback about the uh, study on prayer. And um, make sure that you, uh, we, had, we had a new visitor today who, who um, just started watching this study on prayer or, or just with us on the study on prayer. She was here live. And uh, I had to remind her to make sure she sees the first three weeks study, the first three weeks of the study to catch up because she did have some questions during our Q&A about certain things, about the prayer, uh, how, how the power of the Holy Spirit prays, uh, works in prayer. And what we showed is that the power of the Holy Spirit works in prayer through the believers. Uh, the, work, the Spirit of God dwelling uh, in the grace believer, and, and even the Spirit of God that is in even the, the, uh, the other members of the body of Christ, the, just the heirs of God, it is there to allow them access to the mind of Christ so that they might have the, the power of Christ. The prayer's power is in um, the faith of Christ. The faith of Christ is like the battery that provides the power. And what our faith does is tap into it. And whether you, if you're just, if you're a believer in Christ, if you're a member of the body of Christ, and you by faith tap into the truth of God's word, which, which truth of God, God's word, that's why we're doing this study, it, it is, um, it shows us how to pray, how prayer works. And that's what we're shedding light on prayer. Uh, you can tap into that power. Your prayer life can be active and powerful, okay? And that's what we're looking at. So we've been getting some good feedback. But definitely us grace believers who know the mystery, who, who understand the rightly, rightly divided word, our prayers can be very powerful. And, and so the, the, the sister in the Lord, Denise, she asked about um, the part of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul, we covered that today, Paul, Paul says in Ephesians 6, praying, Ephesians 6, praying with all prayer in the spirit. So it's the spirit of God, that, which is in us as believers, using the word of God and our faith as we pray to God, we intervene in God's affairs. What we saw is prayer is less God intervening in our affairs, but through his providence, it's man intervening in God's affair. In Genesis, we went, we took it to Genesis chapter 20, where we saw that as God dealt with Abimelech, who was going to try to have Sarah, Abraham's wife, God told Abimelech, hey, Abraham's a prophet. He will pray for you. Okay. He'll pray for you. So that's, that's how it's done. God uses mankind. So anyway, we've been getting some good light on that. So make sure you see that we're going to have part five next week. Uh, this week in part four, we dealt with uh, the mechanics of prayer. How, how, how does prayer, which is a spiritual dynamic we saw, you pray with your spirit. How does a natural being or physical being like us take a spiritual thing like prayer and affect the spirit world. And that's what we looked at today. So make sure you see that. We, we saw what, what, the, what energy is behind that, okay? All right. Um, I see Rod and Mark and some others here. Uh, Krista. Oh, today is our anniversary. Krista, I saw you in there. Uh, uh, Krista, Krista Lynn and I, we were married uh, July the 16th, 2004. We met in 2003. Uh, 14 years ago, but we got married 13 years ago today. And uh, the best decision I ever made outside of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, and thank you, Krista. Uh, her parents are coming to town this this upcoming week from, from Minnesota, John and Diane. So we're going to celebrate with them. They, they want to take us out. So I'm here right now at, at church. Uh, Sundays is my longest work day. I, do, I deal with the saints each week and questions all week, but uh, Sundays, and even we even sacrifice our uh, anniversary day if it falls on a Sunday to be with you guys, to use your saints here. Um, we're about an hour behind schedule in our Q&A because Brother Ryan, who is our 
uh, dear brother who puts the the videos that you watch on YouTube, NorCal Grace, he 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 records them, he 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 um, he renders them, he edits them, he gets them all prepared during the week to get to you. And this is his busy season, the summer, um, with his markets, sunshineinthebottle.com. Make sure you do that, Romans 16.1, uh, whatever business, a system or whatever business has become its saints. But um, this is busy season, but he had to get out of here an hour earlier. So normally what Ryan does, he waits till we're done with all of our Q&A, the Facebook Q&A hour, and then I spend an hour or so with him. Uh, we're doing a verse-by-verse -verse study in the Gospels where we're going to make a um, commentary, a video commentary. So if, you got, if, you're, if you're reading through the four Gospels and you can come to our site and say, I want to know what Matthew 28, this, that, and the other, well, we'll, we'll have a video, um, a video commentary. So it's a lot of work, but we're doing that each Sunday for a couple of hours to get that taken care of. Um, but Ryan normally waits to the end to do that, but I had to get his hour in before you guys. That's why we pushed it back. So thank you for your patience. We're going to go about an hour or so, okay? All right. Let's get into our study. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the uh, privilege of having technology where we can do something like Facebook Live and uh, even the Internet where Ryan posts the, the uh, studies so that saints are outside of our, our area here in California all around the world. We hear from people all around the country and the world um, who appreciate this. And so, Father, thank you for that. We ask that you use this time that we're going to take the next hour or so uh, to bless the saints with a greater understanding of your word through these question and answer sessions. We thank you for them, and we ask you bless in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, the first question comes through from last week. Your so, uh, Sister writes, uh, your message on shedding light on prayer, part one, is really good. I am looking forward to part two. Well, we've posted part two. I believe part three, if, if it's not up yet, Ryan will have it up there. And we recorded part four and we got part five. So hold on. People say, Ron, don't, Brother Ron, don't rush through. I'm not rushing through, not rushing through. I could have actually made this thing 10 weeks long, but I, I cut it to five, okay? But but you get the gist of it. You know, it's it's a... Uh, understanding prayer is a lifelong endeavor. You, you, like anything in God's word, you, 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 the, the more you learn about it, um, you mine it out and stuff, the more understanding you gain. You know, I'm still understanding through this study more light on prayer. Okay? So it's a fantastic study, I believe. Uh, this is this question. It says, could you kindly differentiate or show the difference between the Spirit of God the Spirit of the Lord uh, and the Holy Ghost. So she wants to know, I'm not going to write on the board because I'm in selfie mode here, but number one, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, and the Holy Ghost, okay? And number four, uh, she says, does Spirit, lowercase s, does Spirit imply that which God breathed into man in Genesis 2-7? Yes, the human spirit... Um, when God created man, when he made Adam and Eve's body, it says, and God made man, speaking of his body, out of the, in, from the dust of the ground, used some materials already dust, from what, when he flooded the earth uh, before. We, we'll talk more about that. Some, uh, the same sister, I believe, asked a question about Genesis, the gap theory, or gap principle, I call it. But there was dust there. He took the dust, and what, where dust is, there's some decomposition. So there was there was some carbon-based decomposition there, okay? Anyway, the dust of the ground. And he, and he breathed into his nostrils. So he makes Adam's body from the dust of the ground. God then, who's a spirit, breathes into his nostrils. Man's nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That breath of life, that's the man, that's the human spirit, okay? Our human spirit this is what gives us life. Now, when it comes to the spirit of God, in the spirit of the Lord and the Holy Ghost. By the way, she says, I think I heard you mention that the spirit goes back to God that made it. That's Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, Solomon says. Human spirits go back to God that gave it. If you're lost when you die, when you're separated, death means separation, when you're separated from your, it's what James says in James chapter 2, 
as the body without the spirit is dead, so, so is faith without works is dead, being alone for the prophetic saying. When you die, your spirit and soul are separated from your physical body. Your physical body goes and buried, cremated, whatever, lost at sea when you fall over your cruise ship, your Disney cruise ship. Your soul, if you're lost, it goes down to the flame of hell, tormented in that flame. If you're saved, your soul goes up to be depart and be with Christ in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, waiting for the resurrection and rapture. All human spirits go back to God, the Father of spirits. Okay, he's called the Father of spirits in the scriptures. Now, you do have unclean spirits and devils who reside on earth. They're the, they're the disembodied spirits of those satanic creatures, those Nephilim creatures, those giants from Genesis 6 and after also. And when God flooded the earth, because those beings, they weren't created by God, their spirits didn't go back to God. They, they, those spirits, those are the unclean spirits of what we call devils that roam the earth, disembodied spirits. Now, there could have been some pre-Adam, too. I actually believe there were, that, that that original flood where the earth was out form and void and, and darkness and water was on the face of the deep and all that, the water, that was something that happened pre-Adam. Adam, I'll talk more about that later. But at the very least, you have the Genesis 6 Noahic flood spirits. Those are the familiar spirits. Those are the unclean spirits, devils. Now, if you have other versions, they call them demons, but, and you hear people call them demons. The King James Bible doesn't call them demons because uh, demons are, a demon could be good or bad. Good or bad, like the, the little red devil on one side and white on the other, you know, the angel. That's a demon. In the Bible, devils are all bad and unclean spirits, another name for devils. Now, when it comes to the Spirit of God, she says, can you tell me the difference between the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, and the Holy Ghost? Well, let me first say that the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Now, I'm going to show you why they're, they're, they're called different things in different places. But let me show you that the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Go with me, if you will, to John chapter 7. Go to John chapter 7. The Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Okay. Uh, the Holy Ghost is God the Spirit. Okay. Uh, let me show you that. Go to John chapter number 7. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, earthly ministry to Israel. John chapter 7, verse 39. He was speaking about living waters flowing out of a belly. Look, look what he says in verse 39. John writes, John 7, 39. But this spake he of the Lord of the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, that capital S, which they that believe on him should receive. Okay, you saw that in Acts chapter 2 and subsequent after that as members of the little flock believe, uh, you know, as, as Jews become members of the little flock, trusting uh, the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. During the book of Acts, the apostles would lay hands on them, then they received the Holy Ghost. That all changed in Acts 10 with Cornelius. We're going to see that in our prayer study next, next week. Next week's prayer study is about the Exodus 33 principle, the exception principle. Be sure to be that, but we're going to look at Cornelius from Acts 10. But notice in John 7, 39, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because, the, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Ghost could not come until he was glorified. Death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. But notice it says, this spake he of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God, that's that Spirit, capital, this, that's the Spirit of God, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus had not been glorified. So the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost are one and the same. Look at Luke. Go back to Luke chapter 4, verse 21. I like to give you as many verses as I can with, with the time we have. We've got about an hour. Luke chapter 4, verse 21. Pardon me. Luke 4, 21. This is Christ's um, first public ministry uh, teaching. Luke 4, 21. And he began to say unto them. No, that's not the one I want. Oh, yeah, it's sorry. Oh, yeah, 21 and 22. That's not 
Oh, I'm sorry. I hold hold that thought about th about that one. Uh, that's the one about the spirit of the Lord. I'll, I'll get back to that. That's the spirit of the Lord to look for. Um, look at um, Matthew chapter three. Sorry about that. I, I typed in the in the wrong place. That 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 one's the spirit of the Lord. We'll look at the spirit of the Lord in a minute. So the the spirit of God and the Holy Ghost they're one and the same. It's just the spirit of God has to do with uh, his presence. Okay, that's what we're going to see. The Holy Ghost has to do with his person, his power, and his ministry. I'll show you that in a moment. If you look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. Yeah, that's what I want you to see. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending on him like a dove and lighting upon him. Notice when the Lord was baptized by John, it says that the spirit of God descended, right? Okay. Now, let's look at, um, maybe that's why I was over in uh, Luke. Give me a second, Luke 4. I want to do the one where he's, this is the parallel passage from Luke. Luke chapter number Go over to uh, yeah Matthew twelve. I have a few of these here. Matthew twelve. Matthew twelve and verse twenty-eight. Oh, there we go. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. The reason I want you to see that is there are times when the Lord uses the word Spirit of God. Sometimes He uses the Holy Ghost, okay? Uh, that's what I want you to see. That Spirit of God, there, there, these parallel passages, what I want you to see. Sometimes a passage will use, I by the Spirit, or He, the Spirit of God came down like a, do a dove. Um, there's the other passage. I, 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 don't, I can't remember. I don't know why I didn't write it down. But it says that when, I guess we can find it. When, when He was baptized, let me find this for you. When He was baptized, the Holy Ghost came down. That's the one I was looking for. When he was baptized, the Holy Ghost came down. Give me one second. <clears throat> I just typed him. See if we can get that for you. It's very willing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spend too much time on it. I just want you to see that. Let me see. I did it kind of. Uh, uh, in Mark, it says, uh, Mark 1.10, and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit. There you go. So that's when it's, it's, it's not just the spirit of God. I want you to see when it's called the spirit, that's what I want to see. Spirit, capital S-P-I-R-I-T. That is the Holy Spirit. Okay. So it's called the spirit or the spirit of God, which he asked about, or the Holy Spirit. Now, that's, that's the same as the Holy Ghost, except when it's the Spirit, it's his presence. Uh, Psalm 5111, as David is, is praying to God and thanking God, for, or begging God not to kill him for adultery and murder, which you couldn't offer sacrifice to get out under the law. He says, cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. So when the focus is on the Spirit, capital S, uh, let me let me read that one for you. Uh, Psalm chapter fifty-one. I guess we can get them there. We got some. We got some time. Psalm fifty-one, verse eleven. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy holy spirit from me. So I want you to see that issue of the Holy Spirit. When it's focused on the Spirit of God, it's His presence, His very presence. Okay. Um. Isaiah 63, here's another one. Look at Isaiah 63. Just want to get these on record for you. Isaiah 63. So when, when the Bible talks about the Spirit of God or the Spirit, it's talking about His presence. Take not thy presence, take not thy... By the way, 
You and I, as grace believers today, as saved people in the dispensation of grace, we don't have to pray a prayer, no matter what, what sin we adultery, murder, whatever. We never have to say, cast me not away from thy presence, Father. Uh, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. We don't. We're sealed with, with the Spirit of God to the day of redemption. Paul's going to tell us, grieve not. Sealed to the day of redemption. Uh, talks about uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 but he says seal to the day of redemption he talks about uh, you seal with that Holy Spirit of promise that's Ephesians 1 13 seal to the day of redemption that's Ephesians 4 32 when he talks about uh, Ephesians 4 where he talks about um, and, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God we're going to look at all that I just want you to see that we don't have to pray that prayer Isaiah 63 verse 10 Speaking about Israel in, in the wilderness, Isaiah 63, verse 10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old Moses and his people saying, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? And what you're going to see is that God's presence went with the nation of Israel as they went through the wilderness. So that issue of Holy Spirit is God's presence. Uh, let me go, go to the book of Ephesians. Go to the book of Ephesians, if you will. See what the Apostle Paul says about it. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 13. This is the grace believer, remember the body of Christ. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's that gospel of the uncircumcision for Gentiles. In whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We never have to worry about God's spirit leaving us because of sin. I mentioned it in Ephesians 4 earlier. I said for 32. That's, that's my, my verse about being kind. It's Ephesians 4 verse 30. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption, redemption day, the rapture. The point is, the Spirit of God is his presence, okay, when he talks about the Spirit. And we don't have to pray like David to take him away, God not to take him away because we're saved by grace. David wasn't saved under grace. David was under the law. He did receive the mercy of God. We're going to talk about that in our uh, prayer study, part five next week, the Exodus 33 principle. Now, the Spirit of the Lord... The focus when it comes to the spirit of the Lord is judgment. Um, judgment is the issue with the spirit of the Lord. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, our apostle Paul, and now you, you should see this, it should jump off the page now. The Lord is called the righteous judge. Uh, look at, look at uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. 2 Timothy 4 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus. When he calls Jesus Lord, the focus is his judging, his judging. Judge nothing before the Lord come. Lord is associated with judge. You'll see that. He called the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, those who are alive and dead, at his appearing, that, that's the rapture, and his kingdom, that's his second coming. So he's gonna he's gonna have the judgment seat of Christ for the grace believers. Uh, for the body of Christ, let me say that most members of the body of Christ don't don't trust God's grace in the mystery. He's gonna so the judgment seat of Christ, judgment seat of Christ for members of the body of Christ, quick and dead, live and dead, and when He returns in His second coming to Israel, He's gonna judge the quick and the dead there. Okay, that is appearing in His kingdom. Look what Paul says in verse eight for for His faithfulness. In, in chapter 4, verse 8, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. This is our reigning. Joint heirs will reign with Christ. They will, they will reign with him. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, defined as the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. That appearing has to do chapter 1 of 2 Timothy uh, that message of, of mystery gospel grace given to Paul. Okay, you got to love that thing. So the issue with the spirit of the Lord has to do with judgment. 
Um, in Judges chapter 3, verse 10, I'll just read it. Judges 3, 10. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishethmin, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against that man. I ain't going to say his long name. That's probably the longest name in scripture. Chushan Rish shot fame, okay? In Micah 3, verse 8, I didn't even, I'm just, I, I quoted these because it'll take you a long time to find these judges. Mike, Micah, one of the minor prophets of Israel. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. What you're going to see consistently, Lord, the word Lord and the Spirit of the Lord has to do with that spirit of judgment, okay? Judging. So, Spirit of God has to do with his presence or the Holy Spirit, Spirit, the Spirit has to do with his presence, his, his essence being there, his presence. That's the focus. Spirit of the Lord has to do uh, with his judgment, judgment, okay, coming to judge. And the issue of the Holy Ghost, that's more had to do with his person, power, and ministry. The first time the word ghost is used in scripture, it refers to Abraham. In, Abraham, in, in, in Genesis 25, verse 8, Abraham gave up the ghost. Okay? Abraham was a real person. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that when we talk about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, it's some um, little nebulous force out there. No, no, no. The Holy Ghost. Ba Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Godhead. Okay? God, the Holy Ghost, is a real person. It says Jesus, when he was on the cross, he gave up the ghost. Wasn't the Lord Jesus a real person? Yeah, he is. He still is, right? He's alive. But he gave up his ghost. That's who he is. The Holy Ghost is the third person of the Godhead. And he becomes the focus. Most of the time, the words Holy Ghost are used in Scripture is in the book of Acts. A Acts is the actions and activities of the apostles, called the Acts of the Apostles. But really... I call it the actions, activities of God, the Holy Ghost, through the 12 apostles to Israel, and then after that, through the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of us Gentiles, to Grace Apostle. So the Holy Ghost has to do with his person, his power, his ministry. Let me show you that. Um, Paul talks about the power of the Holy Ghost and so forth. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, go there. Look, look, when I say his person, he's a real person, he's God the Holy Ghost. He has power. In the book of Acts, it was like the Spirit, the Spirit, the, uh, the, the, as the Holy Ghost gave him power and so forth. There's power there. And in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says about the mystery, he says, which things also we speak, speaking of the grace believer. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, didn't come from man's wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing what? Spiritual things to spiritual. When the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the Holy Ghost in his earthly ministry, go to John chapter 14. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost was to teach Israel about their Messiah. John 14, verse 26, even in his ministry. John 14, John 14, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, see the Holy Ghost there, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I said unto you. Notice the Holy Ghost, the Father sends the Holy Ghost in his name, he will teach Israel all things. So the Holy Ghost has a teaching ministry, both in the mystery, dispensation of grace, and in prophecy. She says, could you, could you please explain the circumstance why and in which case the Bible uses the difference between the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Well, again, the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit is usually interchangeable. Uh, particularly, the Spirit of God is used back in the Old Testament. It talks about his, his very presence. So when you think about the Spirit of God, it's God's presence there, okay? also called the Holy Spirit. That just describes it. It's set apart, 
pure and holy. It's, 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 it has God's holiness associated with it. The spirit of the Lord has to do with judgment, the righteous judge. So there's judgment there, doling out justice, okay? And then the Holy Ghost, his person, he's a real person. He's not a it. Or when I say it, as the Jehovah's Witnesses put it, like some type of kind of force out there, cosmic force. No, it's a person is my point. He's a person. His power, Paul talks about the power of the Holy Ghost and his ministry. He teaches. The Holy Ghost teaches. The Lord says, he, the Holy Ghost, shall teach you. In most non-King James versions, the different, the different, the difference is not made there. Right. Uh, she said the differentiation is not made there. Right. Because they don't have any. The goal of these other versions is not to teach you to be a Bible student and to edify you and to build you up. It's actually they seek nothing but to cast them down from his, from from his excellency. So yes, only the King James Bible will give you the fullness of who the Lord and God the Father and the Word of God is. Okay. So they don't make a difference in it because, quite frankly, they don't they don't know the difference. They don't these these subtle differences to teach you. Okay, his folk. Sometimes Paul calls the Lord Jesus Lord. Sometimes he calls him Jesus. Lord is his capacity to judge. Jesus is his humanity. Sometimes he calls him Christ. Uh, suffering and glory. By the way, there'll be verses where Paul will call him Jesus Christ, and then Christ Jesus. And people think that that's all the same. It's not. When he puts Christ first, the focus is his sufferings and then the glory, okay? Jesus Christ is his person, who he is. But the, the issue of Christ Jesus has to do, he suffered on the cross and he'll be glorified, okay? All that's important. And those other Bible versions don't make that distinction. Now, there's one that the sister didn't ask about, but I'm going to put on here. It's the spirit of Christ. She asked about the spirit of God. The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Spirit, okay? But what she didn't mention, I'll mention it today, is Romans 8, the Spirit of Christ. Because that's something different than the Spirit of, of God. The Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's something that every human being, or the Holy Ghost is called as well. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? which you have in you. So God's spirit is in us, okay? Each, each and every believer. But that's not the same as the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ is a sanctification. So let me put it to you like this. The spirit of God in each and every grace, uh, uh, saved person today or a member of the body of Christ, that's a positional thing. That's a salvation thing. The moment you trust Christ, the spirit of God comes and he, 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 he comes and, and, and he is, comes inside of you, okay? That spirit is, is everlasting life, is a free gift. That's why you can't lose your salvation. He's in you, okay? That's a positional thing. Your position in Christ, your salvation. The issue of the spirit of Christ, not every member of the body of Christ has the spirit of Christ. In fact, I say most don't because that's a sanctification is, issue. By the way, you can't have the spirit of Christ, his suffering, unless you're suffering in the mystery with him. And most believers aren't. In Romans 8, which sadly even dispensational teachers forget, they'll say Romans 6, 7, and 8, that's about the believer's walk. But when they teach it, they forget about that. They make it all about position. And they change, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not in the flesh but after the spirit. Verse 1, they say, oh, well, the last 10 words shouldn't be there. Uh, this is your salvation. No, this is a sanctification verse. You can, as a believer, walk after the flesh. Many do. Most do. And not after the spirit. But if you look down in Romans 8, look what he says. Verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Those are believers he's talking about. Verse 9. But, in contrast, those who obey Paul's gospel of grace and the mystery, ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, that's a whole different thing. It's one thing, the Spirit of God being in you, positionally. But to dwell there, the Bible talks about dwelling has to do with at home. For example, I am at our assembly. We rent a place out, this board, this whole conference room. I'm here right now. I'm in it. But when I'm done with this, in about 35 minutes, 
my wife and I and Jada Lent, we, they're going to meet me. We're going to go to our dwelling place. We don't dwell here. We're here. We're, I'm, I'm in here. I'm doing stuff here, act, working here, but I don't live here. I don't dwell here. I dwell in another place down the road. Well, that's the same for the Spirit of God. To dwell means to, to, to be at home at. And the Spirit of God is not at home in every believer. You think he was at home? By the way, if he's at home, why would Paul say in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit? Of God? Listen, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. He wouldn't be at home. He's not at home. He's, he's, not, he's grieving because they're rejecting the mystery and the truth of the mystery, the truth. He's not at home. He's not dwelling at home there, no. Now, you got everlasting life, so he's there, but he's not dwelling. Dwelling is more than just being there. It's being at home there. And that's the issue of the Spirit of Christ. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That Spirit of Christ is those who choose to suffer with the Lord Jesus. That's what it means to be a joint heir. Verse 17, that's the context. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, equal share, not joint heirs with Jesus, not joint heirs with the Lord, joint heirs with Christ. It has to do with suffering. If so be that we suffer with him. How is Jesus suffering today? How is Christ suffering today? He's rejection of the truth of the mystery of Christ. That's how. That we may be also glorified together. When he's coronated king of the heavens, we'll reign with him. We will too. Okay? Now, so the spirit of Christ is a sanctification issue. That's something that's built in you. When Paul tells the Galatians, my little children, Galatians 4, of whom I travail in birth again till Christ be formed in you. He says, I, I, I need Christ to be formed in you, to be conformed in, you know, to the image of his son. That is a sanctification issue. And most of the body of Christ today doesn't have the spirit of Christ. Notice he says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That has to do with that loyalty equals royalty. Sorry to break into my uh, Jesse Jackson. Loyalty is royalty. Well, it is. Because when he says he is none of his, he's not saying positionally because you're in Christ. He's talking about in a, sanctif in a sanctification uh, uh, as far as reigning with him. Go to 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2, Paul makes that clear. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Look at verse 12. 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we suffer, that's a do with a context for the mystery, we shall also reign with him. There's that crown of right. We're going to reign with him on those thrones, the main spirit powers, powers, reign with him. Same verse, if we deny him, he will also deny us. That's what he's talking about, because look at the rest of that passage. Go down, verse 19, 2 Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, this is the proof of it, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Those that he judges faithful who have the spirit of Christ, they are his. And what about those who are saved? They don't, they're not his as far as sanctification. Well, here's what you ought to do. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you say you're a member of the body of Christ, then depart from that iniquity of rejecting the mystery. Okay? Paul talks about the spirit of Christ in, in the book of Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter number. Hold your hand in 2 Timothy. <coughs> Pardon me. You can leave it. Go to Philippians chapter 1. We don't have much time, so I better get through these. But I like to give you the verses, man. You can check them out. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, the spirit of Christ. Paul says, we're talking about prayer. We're going to see this next week. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Now, you know he's not talking about soul salvation. Paul's been saved 30 plus years from the road to Damascus here. He's talking about saved from despair and so forth. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. We're learning how that prayer works. And the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. That issue of the spirit of Jesus Christ has to do particularly the focus on what he's doing, how he suffered. Paul was willing to endure sufferings for Jesus Christ's sake, the focus of Christ in particular, okay? When he puts the spirit of Jesus Christ, 
That's how it manifests itself, humanly speaking. Paul, who was a man, was suffering. He himself was filling up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in his body. So he says the spirit of Jesus Christ. The same way the Lord Jesus Christ chose to suffer for the Father's sake during his ministry, the Apostle Paul had that same spirit operating in him. Okay? Um, someone else writes, I know this question has been asked many times regarding gifts. Could you explain which gifts are in operation today? And by no means is this a derogatory question. I know, I, no, I, I understand the spirit is asked then. But I want to ask the question, so they ask this question. I want to ask the question about gifts in this way. If the supernatural gifts given by the Holy Spirit are in operation today, as some say, why do these pastors, and I'm assuming they mean these denominational pastors, have to go to school? Great question. And why do they choose to teach different denominational doctrines? Great question. And why do they choose to change denominations? Why are they not like-minded? Great question. First of all, let me just deal with this, the second part of that. This person is right. The supernatural working of those gifts of the Spirit, particularly for ministry, people didn't have to go to school, you know, some seminary, some cemetery, anything like that. No. God gave them the ability to do it. Let's say for tongues, tongues, for example. Tongues were just different languages of the earth. Paul, Paul also talked about of the of angels, okay? For him, for him. 1 Corinthians 13. Here's the point. But those different languages on the earth, you would not have to go to a, a website like Babel. Interesting they call it Babel. How do they even know that that's what God, that's the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 where God confused the languages? But to go to Babel and you learn how to speak French or Japanese or Spanish or whatever, right? Well, they didn't have to do that. They got the gift as the Spirit gave them utterance, like in Acts 2, the little flock, and then later with the body of Christ. So the question says, if, they are, if they're in operation today, why do pastors have to go to school? Exactly, they wouldn't have to. Remember what the, God, what the Lord said about the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will come down. He'll teach you everything you need to know. You ain't got to go to seminary or Bible school. Why do they choose to teach different denominational doctrines? I know. The questioner is saying, if the Spirit of God is on all these so-called men of God, why are they teaching all these different denominations? Exactly, because the Spirit of God is not working that way today. The Spirit of God wrote down some words through the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Grace. That's how the Spirit of God will teach you today. It doesn't, mind, doesn't mean he won't use people who part in the body. Like my part in the body is to teach and preach and so forth. So God will give you that by his grace, someone to help you understand. But the Spirit of God is not leading these people because they're right. If it was by the Holy Ghost, they would speak the same things. Paul says that you mind the same things. If, if, if they were under the power of the Spirit of God, they wouldn't be teaching different denominational doctrines. Paul says there would be no schism. Christ is not divided. Paul says to Corinthians that you speak the same things. Be of one mind, one accord. Questioner says, and why do they choose to change denominations? Exactly. If the Spirit of God led you in the Baptist, why are you over in Pentecostal now? Or, or uh, evangelical free, you know, all these different denominations. Just switching and changing. Because they're not led by the Spirit of God. They're led by their flesh. The Spirit of God is to lead you to all truth. Today, the Spirit of God will lead you to the mystery of Christ given to and through the Apostle Paul, to the rightly divided word, okay? To the rightly divided word. Jane is waving, so I'm waving back. It's telling me. Hi, Jane. So in the rightly divided word. But let me, let me show you something about this issue of gifts. All of these supernatural spiritual gifts were for a purpose in the infancy of the body of Christ. Paul calls them childish in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. He says that they will cease, fail, and vanish. We've gone over this time and time again. I'm not going to put a lot of time. Today, we do the work of the gifts. Paul tells Timothy in 2 uh, excuse me, in, 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 in uh, Paul tells Timothy in Second Timothy, he says, do the work of an evangelist. One of the gifted men God gave in the emphasis were evangelists. Some 
Uh, Ephesians 4. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. I'll, we can look at that. Ephesians 4. Because 1 Corinthians 13 says the only thing that endures is charity. Whether there be tongues, uh, they, the, um, whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. The gift of prophecy. Whether it be the gift of tongues, it shall cease. The gift, supernatural gift of knowledge shall vanish away. We won't need them when that which is perfect has come. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 11, Paul says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, he goes through some other sign gifts. Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. The Jews required a sign back in Paul's day. The Lord says to the Israel, except you see signs and wonders, you would not believe. Those signs and wonders were for unbelief, not for faith. God gave these ministry gifts to build people up. Notice what he said, Ephesians 4, 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Ryan and I were talking about per perfect. Perfect perfection is you're in Christ positionally, but Christ is in you in, in, in practice. You're in Christ, salvation, Christ in you, sanctification. He tells the Galatians, till Christ be formed in you, they weren't perfected. Paul wants to perfect it for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ till, it's the times, those gifts were given until a certain time, till we all come in a unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so you won't be like children anymore. And when the God gave the completion of his word, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the mystery of Christ is completed. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture, 16 and 17, all scripture, all scripture written down. You don't need all those supernatural working of spiritual gifts. They were, they were for babies. They was in its infancy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, everything you need. He calls it instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. You in Christ, Christ in you, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Also, how does God work today? He takes who you are your personality, your energy, your skills, your, your what we call gifts and talents, who, who you are, your, your uniqueness. And as you get saved and build Christ in you by faith, as you allow God to build Christ in you, he will begin to work through who you are. And everybody's different. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, God has tempered the body as it pleased him. So my part in the body, when I get saved, my part is to be this teacher preacher. God will use who I am, how I can remember the verses and everything. Just everything that makes me unique or makes you unique, God, we're, we're all going to be doing different things, not the same. Paul talks about as God has given to every man the measure of faith, the proportion of faith, like dealing out cards. We all get different cards. You heard about the cards you dealt. Well, use those cards of who you are to serve the Lord. And then as every joint supplieth, we all working together. My part in the body is to do what I'm doing right now. And what I've been doing for the past few hours and last 20 plus years. Your part is something different. But we all can work together, okay? God doesn't need to use supernatural spiritual working of the Holy Ghost as far as direct. He does it indirectly. We were going over that. It's through the word of God, prayer, and so forth, working how his energy works in the believer today. But God doesn't have to use those infant gifts of 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. To do it okay oh great another great question what can we learn from revelation chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 and acts 9 verse 1 and 6 you can read on your own revelation chapter 1 1 and 2 when god gives john a revelation through the lord and, the, and an angel the angel that lord speak to name well let's go read it and in acts chapter 9 verse 1 through 6 that's uh our apostle paul's conversion on the road to damascus to salvation I'm going to read Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So God the Father gives it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Even though it was written 2,000 years ago, it, it, the 
where it fits its future into the tribulation period. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Okay? So, God the Father gives it to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus gives it to an angel. And then the angel gives it to John. Okay? That's not how the Lord dealt with Paul. God the Father gave the mystery of Christ to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus came out of heaven's glory. He didn't speak to an angel. He didn't send a Gabriel or Michael or another angel. He spoke directly to the apostle Paul. And so the brother says, it seems Jesus appeared to Paul himself. Well, not seems, he did. And gave him the message of the mystery of Christ to give to us. That brother is right on. Whereas the revelation of Christ in Revelation was given by God to Jesus, then to an angel, and finally to John. Correct. Chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. John received the revelation of Christ through God's messenger and angel, yet Paul received his message directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's got that right. The question is, how important would it be to take notice of who delivered? Very important. That direct intervention between Jesus and Paul versus Jesus an angel and John is very much important because the Lord Jesus says in Acts 9 he's my chosen vessel the Lord Jesus chose this man Paul directly that shows that direct line a direct apostle to us Gentiles Romans eleven thirteen. Paul says let him acknowledge the things that I write are commandments of the Lord first Corinthians 14 37 when you deal with the 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 the, the apostle Paul you're dealing with the Lord Jesus and when you're dealing with the Lord Jesus today, you have to do it through the Apostle Paul's doctrine. Paul says, First um, Thessalonians 4, For you know what commandments we gave you. Uh, speaking of the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So great. That's a very astute by this brother. He's very good, Brother Mark. What important differences is there, if any, in why Jesus chose to appear to Paul directly? Well, the significance is that it's, it's the importance of who Paul is to you and I today. And, and the Lord Jesus said, he's my chosen vessel. Listen, he, he wants to make it clear that there's, go over to, uh, this is a great one, this is a great one. Go over to Galatians 1, go over to Galatians 1. Here's the verse right here. Look at Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Here it is. But I certify you, brethren, why did the Lord come himself? Didn't give it a name. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. No, no intermediary. He didn't receive it by a man or an angel. Wasn't taught it by an angel. Daniel got it by an angel. John got it by an angel. No, no, no. What Paul got was direct. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. There was no intermediary between the, the, the Lord and the Apostle Paul. And what that shows is the importance of Paul's ministry and message and apostleship, okay? And not that John is not important. I, I guess the best way I can explain it is when you're dealing with Israel before the kingdom, you're dealing with them like children. And because Israel was under the law, Paul calls that tutors and governors. There's this intermediary when, when they're still children. But God, when he deals with the grace believer, the member of the body of Christ, he deals with us as grown up or what we call adult sons. They're the children of Israel in a mediary. There's your little angel. We were talking in our, Ryan and I putting together our uh, verse by verse Matthew uh, commentary, uh, well, well, uh, audio commentary and uh, video commentary. We, we were saying that people get that um, idea of guardian angels because there's, there's a passage where it says, the Lord is telling, telling his disciples, he says, look, you better be like these children and don't harm these children for their angels, their angels stand before my father in heaven every day and they record everything, right? And you see that, that issue of these angels, Hebrew says these angels are ministering spirits sent for those who are the heirs of salvation. Israel, their children, they need angels, guardian angels. Not the grown sons and daughters of God in this city. God treats us like grown up. And, and, and there's, there needs to be no mediator between the father and his, and his sons and daughters. And so God dealt with that in, in type and shadow and pattern through the Apostle Paul. No angel spoke like he did to John. 
the Lord spoke to Paul multiple times directly. Great uh, insight by that saying. Uh, angels are messengers of God, the intermediary between man and God, especially with the Hebrew people. Yep. Psalm 91, 11, he shall give his angels charge over thee. Satan actually quoted part of that verse to the Lord Jesus when he tempted him. Hebrews 1, 14, they're just ministering spirits to, to, to the Hebrew people, Hebrews, Hebrew people, uh, the heirs of salvation. About the angels unawares, that's not how God deals with humanity today in the dispensation of grace. Again, in prof prophecy, with whether it's Abraham, Lot, the 12, I mean, the 12, that book of Acts, the angels are sent to deal with the people on the, in, with the, associated with the earth, his Hebrew people, okay? God deals with the body of Christ, not through angels, but through the Holy Ghost, which is part of our blessing of being in Christ as grace believers, okay? And by the way, uh, sorry for the disconnect. I just saw that it went off, so um, you'll have to re-watch this on the, um, on the replay. Uh, God's focus with the nation of Israel is children. In John 1, verse 11 through 13, he says, to those who received them, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. We have that, uh, we have that privilege and honor now as grace believers, members of the body. Jesus is presented as Israel's Messiah, chosen one, captain, uh, apostle, and high priest. That's why it's Jesus, then the angel, then to John. God sees us, the body of Christ, as grown-up sons. He desires to treat us all as joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 14 through 17, and Galatians 1 through 7. Not all, not all of us respond as joint heirs, those who are willing to suffer as grown-ups, but that's how God wants to treat us. Um, we got about 15 more minutes. This one says, hey, Brother Ron, just wanted to let you know that we praise the Lord that you allow him to use you for the benefits of the saints. Praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. But myself and five others have been meeting, going over some of your YouTube and Facebook lessons, as well as another brother he mentions uh, out in the Midwest. I wanted your advice on if this is enough to start a fellowship of weekly accountability. I did not want to use the word church. That's okay. Church is general. It's, it's, it's a congregation of the saints. I know the Bible, Paul calls it the church of the living God, the pillar ground of truth. I know that the Bible says where two or more are gathered in his name. Well, yeah, that's in prophecy, but it's a general principle that when saints gather, there is, there is, there's a gathering. When, there, when there's, uh, when, when, when saved people gather together, it's technically a congregation. Now it doesn't officially make it a, 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 a an assembly where the, where the work of ministry is going on, okay? If you're just having coffee, two, 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 y'all can come for, you know, you can, you can fellowship a little bit, but it's a lot that goes on into um, a congregation. So that's what we're going to deal with in, in this last set part of this session. We have left the Baptist church yet, uh, sorry, we, we, we have left the Baptist church. Oh, yeah, we have left the Baptist church yet, but it is becoming unbearable, disheartening to follow the legal. I, guess, I think he meant we haven't. We haven't left the Baptist church yet. Well, I'd get out of there if you ask my opinion. Because he writes, it is becoming unbearably disheartening to follow the legalism and works-based teaching to get out of there. It's, it's supposed to be that. That's not what God wants for us. It's grace, under grace. Then, too, I don't want us to be leaving as some angry individuals trying to split you. Don't do that. Don't, don't leave angry. Um, try to reason with them. If they don't want to hear it, just say, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. You, you leave. Anyway, you don't have to do it in a, in a negative, angry way. You don't have to try to split the church. You, you're free to tell other members of the church because they usually say, hey, why you ain't at the church no more? Well, here's why. I learned how to rightly divide the scriptures. You want to learn? Come over to my house. So what you can do, you're not trying to split a church, but you forget, don't worry about splitting the church. What you do is you want members of that church to get saved if they're not, if they are saved, to come into an altar truth. So you're free from God to share this truth of right division with them. 
by inviting them to a Bible study at your home, right? Or to come watch or something. Now, if that splits the church, so be it. Not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to get the truth. But you want to do it in a gracious way, not, not in an angry way. Okay? And now that it's unbearably disheartened to follow that system, I'd say get out of there, but invite some of those people out of love from that church to come hear about you know, our studies or how to rightly divide or something like that. This is tough in so many ways. It is, it is, because you know, there's emotion involved, there's ties involved, there's history there. But you don't have to do it in, a, in an angry way. You can do it in a loving way and just say, here's the reason why we're leaving because you're not rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? Now, if the church leaders kick you out, that's fine, but maybe you can talk, because usually you don't get them, the pastors and stuff, but maybe you can appeal to some of the other congregants at that Baptist church, and maybe a few of them will leave with you and say, I want to learn more about right division and this grace message. Um, And extra hard because I love the brothers and sisters we haven't been in a relationship with. I, I know. That's why it's hard and extra hard because you have a relationship. I, I, I hear this all the time for nearly 10 years. That's a long time. But the way you do, since you already have a rapport with them, you go to them and you say, hey, we're leaving. Like, well, why are you leaving, man? Well, you tell them why. They don't rightly divide here. We're, we're not under law, we're under grace. We're not under this legalistic system. We're not under this works-based teaching as far as to stay saved. Let me teach you right division. You can still go there on Sunday. Once you come on a Saturday or Sunday evening or after your church or another day, and let me, let me talk to you about rightly dividing God's word. You might get a few of them. Just give us some sound advice on this matter. Well, that's it. By the way, well, I, I told you how to deal with those who are still at that church, but let me, let me talk to you about what to do now, new, the, 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 what to do now. To have a properly functioning congregation or assembly you must, you must, you must agree to have responsible leadership and, and, and accountable saints. In other words, you got to have, not a clergy laity, but you got to have someone responsible to oversee this and the people under them desire, uh, you know, agreeing to be accountable to them. That's the difference between a, a, an organized local assembly and just, you know, watching videos and things like that. That's fine. But the way, the major way you to work it out outside of your four walls of your home is amongst a congregation. Paul, he just assumes the saints were meeting. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, therefore, when you come together in one place. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, Paul says that you ought to know how to behave yourself. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, that if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The ultimate reason of the congregation is to be the pillar and ground of truth, have the truth. Live preaching is the, is the perfect will of God. Now, it's hard because there are a lot of faithful preachers, but that's why we have the, this, this, this ministry like this through the internet. But the perfect be live teaching and preaching. There's no other dynamic. Also, felt live fellowship with those of like precious faith. But accountability. And, and what, what takes it from a little glorified Bible study to an actual operating function assembly? Well, two, two things. The main thing is obviously live preaching and teaching. But the second thing is saints have to be accountable. Because, I, I listen. If there's behavior, then there's accountability. You need bishops and overseers. Acts 20, uh, talk about overseers. You, you need this dynamic at work. This is what makes it a functional assembly. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. Paul writes this, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. So there has to be a labor of ministry going on if you have a, a, an assembly. And are over you in the Lord. Paul calls them overseers, a bishop. If you have a Bible study and you want to make it what God wants, you have to have some over, like you have to people say, we're going to do the be, take over leadership. And you got other people say, and we want you to lead and we'll be, oh, we'll be accountable to you and the saints. Like, 
So that's huge. So this is, this is a big decision. And thankfully, over the past six years here in Northern California Grace Fellowship, seven years before that at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship in Minnesota, and then my time in, in, in different ministries in Illinois, we've been part of that system where there were those who were, it's not clergy laity, but the, 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 they, for the work's sake, we, they, they were faithful men to do the work of the ministry, and other saints put themselves accountable to them. You know, I always tell people from afar, I say, they said, Brother Ron, we appreciate the ministry. We want to be a part of it. I said, pray for us, give. But understand, it's harder from afar, but understand part of our local assembly is that we're held accountable one to another. Me as the pastor, everybody else is saints. So you got to be a part of that. And it's hard to do that from afar. It's hard to do that if you're just having a little Bible study with people. Well, he can't, he, he can't tell. First of all, you got to get... I mean, you got to get order. The men are the ones to lead. The women are led. So they got, you got to get that agreement. I've seen studies where the women want to lead. God never allowed that. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority of the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgressed. You, God doesn't even, so you got to get that worked out. If there's women there, are they willing to be in submission to God's order in assembly? Then you got to get other men who say, okay, we're going to lead this thing. And then other men say, all right, we're going to allow you to lead. We'll be under your, your uh, um, oversight over you and the Lord and admonish you. By the way, that word admonish, let me show you that. The word admonish, all right, yeah, 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Got a lot of uh, words from the scriptures. Admonish, you got to have this in your study it, to make it a church. Because you, you don't have this in a regular Bible study. See, to go from a glorified Bible study to actual work in assembly is more than just people or watching videos or listening to studies or just having, having your Bibles open. you got to have this structure that God, that's why I've been going over this. So you got to have some oversight, some responsibility and accountability. Admonish. That's what he says. They're going to admonish you. To warn or notify of a fault. To reprove with mildness, to counsel against wrong practices, to caution or advise, to instruct or direct. You got to have some people who says, we want you, Brother Ron, to, to warn and notify of, of the faults, to reprove us with mildness. That's what Paul talks about, reprove, 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 uh, reprove rebuke, correct, with all long-suffering doctrine and so forth, Second Timothy. To counsel against wrong practice, are you willing to have somebody tell you, man, that's wrong? To caution or advise, to instruct or direct, to direct, give you direction. Are you willing in this Bible study or this home study to make it a... Oh, I like this by Webster. In ecclesiastical circles, church discipline. Are you willing to be held accountable in discipline? See, that's a huge thing. And see, it's real easy just to watch videos or listen to this, that, and the other and not be held accountable. Not to put skin in the game with your time, treasure, talents, being involved. But, but in, in, including all that time, treasure, talent, being a part, fruit abounding your account, I ask people, are you willing, if you want to be part of this ministry from afar, are you willing to be admonished? Are you willing to be admonished? That's part of the deal. And that's where the rubber hits the road with most, the difference between a local assembly and a Bible study or a glorified Bible study or watching videos and all that stuff. All that stuff is good, but that's what really perfects a fellowship is do you have leaders and you have people who will and be led? Are you doing it in the order that God says it where the sisters in the Lord are willing to be under the headship of the man. The, that there are other men who are willing to take the back seat and let someone lead. And all of you guys says, yes, we want to have this spirit. If this spirit works in your congregation right here, and we, uh, the first Thessalonians chapter five, verse 12, and we beseech you brethren to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. So they're going to be over you and admonish you do you have this attitude 
Brother Tim from Minnesota, when he visited, he says, this is how we see Brother Ron in the ministry. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. So you got to have very high esteem, very high esteem. Not because they're perfect, but because for the work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. You want to take your Bible study or your group who watches videos or what's up, to be an assembly, you got to have that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, you got to have that. Admonishing to warn or notify of a fault, to reprove with mildness, to counsel against wrong practice, to caution or advise, to instruct or direct. In ecclesiastical terms, church discipline. You got to have it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, if others have this power over you, why, why not me? He goes through it. Uh, it's hard from afar. Paul talks about making judgments, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6. He's like, you guys, we're, we're going to judge angels and we're going to judge the world and y'all can't sit and have the least esteem in the church to judge this nonsense in 1 Corinthians 6? You guys are crazy. My point is, what takes your Bible study from watching videos or just sitting and looking at the Bible together is you need preferably that live preaching and teaching, that bishop, those deacons to kind of lead the thing, get it going. The order that God created, man and woman, and also what, what, what rounds it off, you know how to behave yourself in the house of God. That's putting the, the rubber of being a grace believer on the road. How do you handle with other saints? Are you willing to be under that admonishing authority? That, that's what a local assembly is all about, okay? And if you can do, if y'all can get that, praise the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. All right, we're coming down in. I, I'll, I'll get, see if, if I can get at least the one more in there. Then I'll let you know. Uh, you know what? I'll just let you know. I got these uh, this this week. So we'll start with this one. Great, these are great ones. Um, um, Brother Mark asked this. Hello, Brother Ron. Do you think people who are told that if they just believe uh, the facts of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that, that they're saved. Uh, he calls them historical facts. Or are they actually trusting in their faith rather than trusting in Jesus as their savior based on the fact that he accomplished those things for us on our behalf, for our salvation? It bothers me when the passage of scripture is used for a prescription to be saved if it was, it seems like Paul would have repeated it in Romans. Thank you. You know what? This brother is right on, as usual. Great question. I love it. It's mine. It's a great question. Um, next week, we'll pick up. We want to show the purpose of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Although a lot of dispensationalists use it as the prescription, that's not actually what Paul is talking about in the passage. He's talking about the physical bodily resurrection. The saved there is not soul salvation we're going to see. It's saved from confusion from 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 loss of reward and so forth i'll show you that um and yes to be as clear as can be i would use romans 3 verses 19 through 26 to show the mechanics of, of salvation what to trust and who to trust the lord jesus and his blood now so i'll explain all that we'll look at that in detail next week uh, another one says my friend who is a missionary they're teaching salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. But after that, people are saved. They should keep the Ten Commandments because they'll become lawless. And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Oh, boy. We're going to get into that because this sister sent this. The people she's talking about, they don't rightly divide. So um, she says, she says they use a, a, chap, a, 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 a passage from Amos and a passage from Ephesians. They, uh, that that's the mystery. We'll talk about that. She said he keeps the Sabbath. Well, I, I doubt that, but he claims to keep the Sabbath. Celebrates all the feast days, eats kosher and all that. Yeah, yeah. We'll look, talk about all that. I don't know to re how to reach him. I am a woman, so I'm not in a position to te teach him. Can you please help me? Well, you are in a position to uh, share resources with him. You don't, have to, you don't have to be the one teaching directly. You can share our our studies but also i i believe i sent this sister some resources to hand over and share you can't you can be a vessel of honor sharing even a woman to a man uh, number one a, a man is not going to receive your words 
spiritually because God didn't make them to. He's going to reject it. But you can give them resources of other brothers in the Lord like myself and others who can help them. And we'll do that, okay? All right. Let's see here. A couple other questions we'll get to next week. Hi, Brother Ron. Oh, this one's about the gap theory about Genesis. This is a good one. So this will be our third question for next week. Um, hi, Brother Ron. I know this is not pivotal, pivotal to our Pauline doctrine, but I'm sure you've heard of the gap theory, which for many years I believed until recently, as I see it paves the way into evolution and the earth being thousands, if not millions of years. My question is, pertains to Genesis 1. I would like to know if the angelic creation happened also. To, okay, so it's a long question, but we're going to get into a very good, thorough question. We'll answer that. Another one, uh, Brother Ron, is there a difference between the gospel of God in Romans 1 and gospel of grace? Great question. We'll talk about that. And lastly, Brother Ron, will believers receive some type of punishment at the judgment seat of Christ for the evil that they have done after being saved? Or will they just not receive a reward? Great question. Same, Brother Mark. Um, these are awesome questions. We'll, we'll start. That's why I said I'm, we're going to talk about it. We're going to answer all those in order. And then the, the rest of the ones that we get during the week that aren't personal in nature. Most of I get a lot of personal ones I have to deal with during the week. But the ones that I can share with you guys through these studies, I will. All right. Um, we went about an hour or so. Um, Thank you all for listening in. It's my pleasure to do these. Uh, it's a good outlet for me, even after uh, teaching the word. Now it would be about uh, going on seven hours. And as you can see, by the time I do these things, I'm a little tired. I did this an hour later, so I'm tired mentally, phys physiological effect of the, the spiritual battle and preaching. Um, it wears you out mentally, so... Hopefully you guys are still getting stuff out of it. But um, Ryan should be posting our fourth study on prayer, Shedding Light on Prayer this week. Uh, be in prayer for our ministry. We'll be it for you. Um, you can help. If you like to give back, you appreciate it. And, and, and we thank you, saints. Pray for us and give right at our um, YouTube channel, NorCal Grace, on the About page. It's not updated. That thing is old. Jada Lynn was a little girl. She ate now. But... We hit a donate button, uh, donate here. You can give, it made, they made it even easier uh, if you want to give that way. It helps us keep the, the doors open here, rent out this place. We got a monthly rent and, and other expenses. We get materials to send out and stuff for people all around the world. So that really helps us out, okay? And any little bit you give is not the amount, it's the hard attitude behind it. And God is between you and God. But every bit helps us to keep this ministry going for the Lord's sake and for you guys. It's my anniversary today, but we're gonna we, we're here in the evening. My wife sacrifice, our daughter sacrifice, our family, because we are addicted to the ministry of the saints, and we appreciate uh, your feedback and your help in ministry. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together as we end our Facebook Live study this time this week. We thank you for that, and um, thank you for the blessing of having your Son, the Lord Jesus, as our Savior. His shed blood on the cross for our sins. It's the reason we can have a relationship with you, my Father, and we can grow into his image by faith. Thank you for your holy word. And Father, I thank you for these saints who take the time out to listen live and those who, uh, who listen during the week to the posting of it. I pray for them and I'm thankful that even though they can't be with us in the flesh, to bless us in that way, they can join us in the spirit in this way. So I ask your uh, blessing of your grace be upon them as well. Thank you for, for all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, next week, we're going to attempt to do our live study. Ryan's be out of town. That's why he had to leave. Uh, he had to leave early. Ryan will be out of town. So I'm going to do the recording. But I'm also going to try. He was like, hey, try to do a Facebook live preaching of the first session. So face, uh, we're going to do Facebook live the first session. We, we normally get started around 11.30. People get here. It's a great church. We talk. We eat. We fellowship. We ain't seen each other all week. So I normally start to preach about 11.25. I'm going to let you know that uh, I'll give you an update. 
and say, hey, we're going to get started. I think we're going to go ahead and record live next Sunday about 11, 20, 11, 30 Pacific time a.m. Our first session, which is going to be our fifth part of Shedding Light on Prayer. So join us for that if you can. It'll be about 1130 our time here. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you. I hear my wife out there calling. God's grace and peace. See you then, Brother Ron.